Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for October 5th, 2020. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Katni, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on microcontrollers, which are tiny computers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so support them by purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about the changes to the meeting, um, as in sending you an actual notification, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's also a calendar available that we try to keep updated. Um, and as noted, next week's meeting will be on Tuesday at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. So we will remind you of that again at the end of this meeting. Uh, this meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and the video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate, and we'll cover that in a minute. The video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube, and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate and you don't have a mic or you'd rather not have your voice recorded, we can add your updates to the notes doc and read them off and get to you. As well, if you wish to participate but you can't make it to the meeting, you can leave your hug reports and status updates for us in the notes document and we'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use that to skip around the video to the parts that interest you most. If you're just listening in, please let us know that you're lurking and we'll skip over you. If possible, please add your name to the notes doc with lurking after it. Otherwise, let us know in the text channel and we can get it updated. It's important that your status is in the doc because that's what we use when we go through the two round robins that we'll talk about in a minute here um, to call on people to participate. If you wish to speak during the meeting, you need to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role. We had some issues with spammers and so we had to lock it down. Um, please ask anyone in the meeting who is an admin or moderator to add you to the role if you are not um, already a member. And if you don't want to be added to the role, you can still participate as text only. Uh, just let us know how you want to do it. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the project. It's a chance to look at the health of the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to uh, take the time to recognize all the awesome folks in our community and all the great things that everyone's doing. This section is the first of two round robins where we'll begin with the person who is hosting, so I will start, and then I'll go through the list alphabetically, looping back to the top to give everyone who wants to a chance to participate. If you are lurking, I'll skip over you. If you're text only or missing the meeting and you have notes, I will read off your notes to you in the list. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting or what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. It's also an opportunity for folks to provide tips and tricks in response to others' updates. This section is also held in a round robin. Um, and again, if you're lurking, we'll skip over you. If you're text only, we'll read your notes. Uh, and the fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. We put this at the end so that folks who uh, are more interested in the general meeting can listen up to that point. Uh, and those who want to dive into the weeds with us can continue to listen on if that is what they want to do. If you have an in the weeds topic now, please add them to the notes doc along with your name in the in the in the weeds section at the end of the document. If you th uh, think of them during the meeting, add them as you come up with them. That way we're not waiting around at the end to see if anyone has anything to discuss. When we get to in the weeds, we'll turn it over to whomever added the topic to begin the discussion. And if you're text only, please make a note of that so that I can read it off and begin the discussion. And that covers how the meeting will go. 
So with that, uh, let's get started with community news. First up, a CircuitPython programmable watch. Twitter user and CircuitPythonista TG Techie is progressing with work on a watch running CircuitPython. TG Techie writes, Choosing CircuitPython for the firmware was certainly the right choice. Having a REPL makes testing onboard components easy as pie. In the latest updates, the new GUI framework is coming along. Uh, next up is uh, the Python Developer Survey for 2020. This year, the Python Software Foundation is conducting the fourth iteration of the official Python Developer Survey. The goal is to capture the current state of the language and the ecosystem around it. By comparing the results of last year's, they can identify and share with everyone the hottest trends in the Python community and the key insights into it. In 2019, more than 24,000 Python users from 150 countries participated how they sh and shared how they use the language. Um, the survey takes about 10 minutes to complete and is available on the Python blog. And next up is um, Unexpected Makers Feather S2. The Feather S2 is a pro ESP32 S2 based development board in a Feather format. And it has some nice extras, a 16 megabyte flash, eight megabytes of PS RAM, and a STEM QT quick connector. And it comes flashed with CircuitPython 6.0 beta one. And that's available from Unexpected Maker. So this is a preview of the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, you can submit your own news and stories by emailing uh, Anne at adafruit.com or um, sending it over Twitter to Anne underscore engineer. The, um, the draft for each week is always hosted on GitHub, so if you'd rather make a PR to the repo, that's also available as an option. Um, and we love to hear what people are up to. So if you have any stories or anything that you've found or something that you're doing, please submit it so we can get it put into the newsletter and share it with everyone. And that is community news. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So this is the statistical overview of the project um, by the numbers. We'll start overall um, looking at uh, info that covers all three of those things. And then we will separately talk about the core, the libraries, and Blinka. Um, so, and I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core and Melissa to talk about Blinka when we get to that point. So overall, we had 12 pull requests merged by eight authors um, I don't recognize Thomas Burgess 2000, um, so I believe they may be a new contributor, thank you. And six reviewers. Uh, we had 16 issues closed by six people and 12 opened by 12 people. There's two things about that that I want to note. One, we're down um, open issues, which is excellent. And two, uh, the 12 that were open being opened by 12 different people is excellent. Um, it's great to see that much participation, um, something we like to see, so it was worth noting. And then something that uh, will show up during um, the month of October is that we assigned Hacktoberfest label to 27 issues. Um, the Hacktoberfest label gets assigned automatically to good first issues, so that means um, that we had 27 good first issues across the entire project. Uh, good first issues are, as it sounds, um, a good issue for someone who uh, is get, just getting started. Uh, so we set up a system to using our Adabot script to uh, automatically apply that. And I noticed that we're gonna be discussing um, our participation in Hacktoberfest in, in the weeds. So that is worth a thing. So overall, um, we are in fact just hearing the news that we're releasing, releasing CircuitPython 6.0 beta 2. Um, we just released beta 1, but there was a fix that went in and we wanted to get that out, so we're releasing beta two. Um, in terms of the libraries, we're continuing to see more added, which is excellent because that means we're continuing to see more hardware added. Um, and as well, uh, we recently had a library added that was written by a community member, which was excellent to see um, for hardware that we have, um, which is also great. And uh, Blinka, um, can support board support for Blinka continues to grow as well, so that's always um, great to see as well. And with that, I will 
turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. Hello, thank you, Katni. Okay, in the last week we had one pull request merged, which doesn't seem right. Um, we'll have to take a look at that. That that doesn't sound right. Um, for the whole week, we we I definitely merged a bunch of stuff last week. Um, so take a, these numbers with a grain of salt. Uh, we have 18 open pull requests between 110 days old and one day old, which is about what we typically have. Uh, we have one closed issue by one person and one open by one person. Uh, and we have uh, Hacktoberfest on 19 issues as well, which mm, I think is the overall number to... Oh, no, it's 27. Okay, so that, that 19 might be the core. Uh, we had 326 open issues. Uh, we have seven active milestones. Uh, the key ones here are like how many issues do not have a milestone, which is two. And then we have um, five open issues for 600, uh, which is kind of like what is preventing us from having a stable 60 release. Um, and that's, I think, it for the core. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Next up is the libraries. So this covers all Adafruit libraries, um, Adafruit circuit Python libraries rather, and so that's everything that's Adafruit underscore circuit Python underscore and a couple of extras as well. Uh, we had 10 pull requests merged uh, by seven authors and six reviewers. Um, of those merged pull requests, uh, two of them were about two weeks old and the rest were all within zero or one days. We had 14 issues closed by six people and 11 open by 11 people, leaving us with 203 open issues. We assigned the Hacktoberfest label to eight issues. So we had eight good first issues, uh, which it is also stated in this data. And we currently have um, 27 open pull requests. Um, if you, let's see, uh, in terms of new libraries, uh, we had the SH1107 library was added. Um, that was the one that was contributed by, uh, primarily by a community member. So that was excellent to see. And a number of updated libraries as well. Um, if you are interested in any, any of this or interested in contributing to CircuitPython, the libraries are a great way to start. You can go to circuitpython.org slash contributing and um, you'll find a list of open PRs, a list of open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues. And those uh, three things are great places to start. You can search the issues by label, and if you are new to all of it, good first issues are a great place to look. Um, if you are not so new to all of it and you want to get involved in, um, in uh, reviewing, that's another great thing to do. Take a look at a PR. If you have any comments on it, leave them in the uh, list and let us know. Um, if you have the hardware, feel free to test it, that sort of thing. Any kind of help is always wanted. Uh, if you're new to Git and GitHub, we have a guide. And if um, you uh, still have questions beyond that, we are always available to help. We want to see you start contributing um, at the level that you would like to. So we are happy to help you with that at any time. Uh, and that's where we are at the library. So with that, I will turn it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka. Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. Uh, this week, we had one pull request merged by one author and two reviewers. There are currently two open pull requests. Uh, there was one closed issue by one person and zero open by zero people. And we have the Hacktoberfest label assigned to zero issues currently. Uh, there are 25 open issues at the moment, and we had 2,241 PyPI downloads in the last week. And there are currently 52 boards supported. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. And that is the state of Circuit Python, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to call people out for doing something good. Um, it's a chance for us to talk about all the awesome people in our community and just to uh, take time to have positive discussions. Um, so I, this, this section is held in a round robin where I will start and then um, I will go down the list alphabetically. 
If you're lurking, I will skip over you. If you're text only and you have notes or t are lurking and have notes, I will read them. Um, and then uh, I will loop back to the top and give everyone who wants to a chance to participate. Um, so with that, I will get started. So uh, first and foremost, I wanted to give a hug report to our uh, Adafruit Learn developers. Um, they added translation features to the Adafruit Learn system. We've had um, a number of translations recently, and the way that they were done was a super hacky workaround, and um, finding them meant that you needed to search separately for it and that sort of thing. And what they've done is added uh, some localization features where the guides are now linked and you can choose the language from a drop down. Um, and creating the guide is, is also easier internally. So I wanted to give them a huge hug report for that. Um, I've been helping the translators uh, as they've been translating CircuitPython guides and this is a huge improvement and I'm really excited to see that. Uh, hug report to Dan H for a much needed chat um, and a hug report to Jeff Epler for chatting with me as well. Um, also much needed to foamy guy for updating some guides recently thank you very much it's um simple stuff but it's stuff that a lot of people were catching and having issues with so i really appreciate it, it was uh simply updating a screenshot and one thing in some text uh, but it made a huge difference and thanks to scott for covering the meeting last week so i didn't have to scramble coming back from being out uh, next up is melissa Hello. Hi. Uh, okay, uh, I wanted to give a hack report to Paint Your Dragon for pointing me to a great um, QT Pi Hackspress image I hadn't noticed. I had a report to Carter for the Neo Princess Spy Library, which came in handy with the Jetson and a group bug. That's it. Excellent. Next, I have notes from Mark Gambler who says, uh, hug report to Jepler for the amazing MP3 code I keep using in all of my projects. Uh, next up is Microdev. I have a hug report for Kevin and Tenute for suggesting a way to implement USB check. Excellent. Um, couple lurkers and uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, uh, hug report to Lady Ada for the thorough testing of the ESP32-S2. Uh, she found an issue with display I.O. on the S2, which is awesome and super helpful to find. Hug report to Jeff Epler for holding down the fort while Dan is healing up. Uh, really appreciate all of the reviews and such. And also a hug report to Higher Effect for tackling switching back to the Espressif IDF copy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of tedious work to do. So uh, thanks to Higher Effect for taking that on. All right. <clears throat> Next up, I have notes for C. Grover, who says to Al Sweitgart for the reinforcing some important coding concepts in his Python books. Looking forward to the next one. To M0 for an extremely helpful display coding suggestion. Added just one line of code that yielded gigantic performance improvement for the range slicer module project and a group hug to the team and community. Next, I have notes for David Gloud, who says to KJW for the Clue Gizmo BLE scanner, to Tan Newt for a hint on parsing BLE advertisement and a group hug. And next up is to Shifu. Uh, okay, so I'd like to thank you, uh, thank uh, Christo, Christian uh, Walker for his wor work on uh, uh, basically saving uh, various information between restarts of the device. Uh, that is going to be very useful with the PewPew Pew, uh, consoles and uh, group, group hack. Excellent, thank you. Next up, I have notes from Foamy Guy, who has a group hug to Jepler, I think you introduced me to git grep recently. It's been a really useful tool to have picked up. 
hug for anyone working on and testing the ESP32 S2. Very excited to see Unexpected Maker's Feather and a sneak peek at the ESP32 S2 Metro on the desk of Lady Ada. Next up is Higher Effect. Um, big thanks this week to uh, Julian Rendell, uh, who's a community contributor for helping test the uh, updates to the ESP IDF change. Uh, thanks to uh, TAC for providing his input on Tiny USB, uh, suggesting fix for one of the IDF issues. And just this morning, um, starting work on, on testing out what's going on with Tiny USB compatibility with the IDF. Uh, thanks to Jeff for his hard work on STM32 CAN this past week. Uh, to Scott for his uh, reviews on my analog IO code this week. And uh, thanks to Mark Olson for figuring out the USB issue with the um, CM32F1 uh, full speed USB peripheral. And uh, he submitted a, a fix to tiny USB that needs some tweaks, but we can also put that fix in CircuitPython. So that's useful. That's it for me. All right. Thank you. Next is Jopler. Hello. I have a group hug for everybody, but some specific ones. I uh, want to see Walther for working on the low-level memory management code, which is related to uh, what Deshipu was mentioning. And uh, I asked to put that off for beta 1, but I think that we can get that merged soon because I've had a chance to test it a little closer. Uh, hug to you, Katni. Hang in there while you deal with some junk. Uh, to Foamy Guy, I don't remember if I thanked you for your core contribution, which uh, would have gone in a week ago or more. Uh, it was perfect, except for just one thing we didn't anticipate. And uh, thank you, Higher Effect, for stepping up to test CanIO on the STM32. Um, hope you saw those links to the hardware you may need. And thanks to Sedacious for the work together on various CanIO implementations. Um, he did the MCP2515, and I did uh, two different microcontrollers, and it was just helpful to ping pong the ideas back and forth and so forth. Excellent. Next up is Jerry. Hi, everyone. Just a socially distant group hug. Thanks. Excellent. And that is Hug Reports. Thanks, everyone. Next up is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity for all of us to sync up on what we have been up to since the last meeting and what we're going to be up to until the next meeting. Um, Take a couple minutes, talk about any kind of projects you're working on. Um, we also love to hear what it is you're up to in general. Um, so take a couple minutes, talk about your, your CircuitPython and or uh, other related things. And then if you wanna add on something fun that you have been doing, uh, feel free. Um, I will start as uh, another round robin, uh, and then we will go down the list, loop around, um, do the same thing. Um, as we did in Hug Reports, except this time with our statuses. So with that, I will get started. Uh, last week, I uh, provided a list of previously translated guides to LearnDev to connect to their originals. Um, any new translations that are created are automatically connected to the guide that they are translating, um, but all of the trans guides that were translated before this fix went in um, were not linked. And so uh, they wanted to get them all linked so the dropdown works for everything. And um, they needed a list of translated guides. And I am the one who had that list. So I was able to get that to them and uh, make sure that everything got linked. So that was great. Um, published and blogged the Cutie Pie guide. So if you got a Cutie Pie and you're wondering how to get started or where to get started or you want um, pinouts, etc. Um, the guide is there and ready to go. I updated the TSL 2591 guide to include the STEM QT version. That is updated and done, so if you um, buy the new version, the guide is uh, updated and ready to go for that. I put the LTC 4331 guide into moderation. Um, it's, a, I think I want to say, an I2C extender, so there's not a whole lot to that guide because um, it's a simple chip, but as well who um, got one of those, keep an eye out for that guide. Uh, started the MIDI Featherwing guide. Um, so the skeleton of that is in place. I believe we're gonna have somebody do, add, add a MIDI Featherwing project, I think, to the guide is how that's gonna go. 
um, that won't be me. So that guide is, I think, as far as I can get it. And I polished up the CircuitPython Display I.O. SH1107 library for release and got it released. That was written by a community member whose name I am t completely forgetting, and I apologize for that. Um, but it needed uh, technical stuff added, you know, our, our cookie cutter and license files and all of that stuff. So, um, and some linting and some Sphinx fixes. So I got all that in and got that going, got the documentation up and that sort of thing. So this week, uh, testing the LED animation library on Trinket, which is ostensibly testing it on Cutie Pie, but I don't have one in hand yet. The Trinket's close enough for this. Uh, update, the library doesn't even fit on Trinket. Um, so that doesn't work. So the second thing, which was originally a Cutie Pie and LED animations guide, is actually a Cutie Pie and LEDs guide. Um, I, am, I was thinking of MD Roberts uh, 1243. Yes. So thank you very much, Jeff, for that. That's who wrote the SH1107 library for us. Um, so the Cutie Pie guide is now going to be um, Cutie Pie um, and LEDs guide. So just how to connect NeoPixels to a Cutie Pie and do some things with it. Um, but the next step is to solder up a Cutie Pie Hack Express, which um, I should have in hand today, and test the LED animation library on that, um, and then presumably either write a second guide or write um, pages into the LED guide um, with that. I'm not quite sure what the steps, next steps will be with that. I have to talk a little more about it, but this is the next steps for me. And then now that we have uh, CircuitPython support for the SH1107, which is a... Um, bigger OLED Featherwing that we have, um, I believe. Um, now that we have CircuitPython support for it, we need to add CircuitPython page to the guide. Um, the fact that the chip was different enough, we wrote a separate guide for it. There's Arduino code for it, but there was no CircuitPython code, so adding a CircuitPython page to that guide. So if you've got one of those um, and you're looking to use it with CircuitPython, keep an eye out for that page. It should be up fairly soon, um, likely this week. And uh, I guess that's all I've got. Um, I think there was more, but uh, it's not in these notes, it's in different notes, and I'm not gonna go dig up those notes. So this is all that anybody can that's listening to this meeting will know that I uh, Next up, I have notes for Kmatch98, who I believe is actually, um, are they in the meeting? Nope, they're missing the meeting, so. Um, Last week, no progress to report. This week, create group touch response for display elements, other fun stuff, repaint and add shelves to laundry room. And next up is maker Melissa. Hello, uh, last week I wrote a, uh, oh, actually skip me, I'm on the wrong thing here. Okay, um, yeah, I'll come back to you. Okay. Um, which means next up is uh, Scott, actually. Hello. Sorry, I'm juggling stuff. Yes. Uh, so I, I released beta one, and in fact, I just tagged beta two. Uh, looks like I, I was seeing on the forums that some folks hit the RGB matrix issue, so I was like, oh, I'll just do beta two. Uh, I have the process down, given that I did beta one last week. So that should be nice and quick. Uh, I tagged it, wrote the release notes. I need to do the download counts, which shouldn't take too long, um, and do the blog posts and stuff. But uh, should be tagged. It's building right now, so that should be good. Um, I fixed some digital I.O. issues I mentioned earlier that Lady Ada found on the Metro. Basically, any pin that didn't default to GPIO wasn't working correctly. Um, so I got that fixed. Uh, that was with her testing on the Metro ESP32S2. Most of my time last week went to working on the IMX RT uh, boot issues. Uh, we're taking a look at that chip again. So I uh, thought that would be a good break from the S2 as well. And then um, after the, I'm through this IMX stuff, which is super annoying, uh, which should be the next day or two, I'll be on to fixing releases to get uh, 6.0 stable. Um, I think there's just a few uh, last things we need to do. So that's going to be my focus. And then after that, it will be um, I need to get back to the deep sleep stuff that Microdose is working on. I said I would help out with that, and then I got distracted with IMX stuff. So uh, that's something I definitely want to do soon. So 
that's also on my list. All right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Scott. Melissa, are you ready? I am. Excellent. Somehow, uh, Google Docs, that would be a great idea to load last week's oh. notes All um, right. for me. So I got this week's. OK. Uh, OK, so last week, I wrote a sprite sheet animation slideshow demo for John Park's workshop. I did a Jetson Nano Learn Guide refresh, including a new Spy page. Uh, I added a NeoPixel page using Spy uh, to that guide. I figured out how to enable using more than 170 NeoPixels on the Jetson Nano by increasing the Spy buffer size. And I added that info to the NeoPixel page. Uh, I updated Adafruit IO to allow increasing uh, the spy buffer size with an environment variable. I made some minor fixes to the PyTFT installer script. I wrote a Blinka installer script for the Raspberry Pi that will perform a bunch of checks and update a lot of things. I updated the matrix portal library to work with both uh, RGB matrix feather wings. I fixed uh, an issue with the Action CI GitHub repo that was causing any PRs that used pre commit hooks to fail. Uh, I worked on the BrainCraft hat guide, and that should be ready soon. And I did an update of the boards on the circuitpython.org website. Uh, this week, I need to finish up the BrainCraft hat guide and update the machine learning guide, the BrainCraft hat. I needed to finish the BrainCraft hat guide first. And I'm not sure what I'll have be after that. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. I have notes for C. Grover now, who says, finished the foundational range slicer circuit Python library and conducted some beta tests. Improved overall latency of the primary function from uh, 500 more than 500 microseconds to about 340 and learned a lot about real-time coding schemes in the process wrapping up the concept video this week two new projects for the euro rack will commence next week a cv xy scope and precision vco both will borrow heavily from the range slicer library and hardware implementation next i have from david gloud who says, heavy work on detecting COVID apps. Clue version based on work by KJW, and there's a link in the notes, and a simplified version for the Circuit Playground Bluefruit. Um, first time since a long time, a direct order from Adafruit. I hope not too bad surprise from Customs and VAT. Uh, Cutie Pie, Matrix Portal, Braincraft, etc. And next up is Dashipu. Uh, okay, so it's been a while since I last had a status report. So basically, over the last two months, I I have uh, back about uh, keyboards, uh, specifically mechanical keyboards that are low profile and ortolinear. So all the columns are in in, uh, in a grid, basically. And I got so in love with them that I built three, and I'm working on a fourth right now and uh, and to to get those uh, keyboards to work i wrote a simple library for circuit python for keyboards which is uh, much simpler and much less resource uh, intensive than uh, the kmk library that already exists for keyboards for the uh, circuit python so it actually runs on uh, samd21 without external flash so oh, that that makes it super easy to to just put a SMD21 on a keyboard and uh, program it with Circuit Python. Uh, I have put the code on GitHub so far. There is no documentation. There are some examples. I'm going to need to fix that, and that's pretty much it. Oh, I'm also uh, testing now the the uh, six oh six uh, betas with the uh, PewPew devices and there seem to be some problems in there. So I, I'd like to talk about that in the week. OK. Sounds great. Uh, thank you. Next, I have notes for Foamy Guy. Uh, so testing the code in an older Pi Gamer thermal camera guide and getting it updated for the latest Pi Badger library. 
Testing to replicate an issue with a Feather STM32F405 and a Feather Cricket resulting in a seemingly random OS error number 5 input output error. Uh, are there any known issues with I2C bus device on the STM32F405 that produce this error? Does anyone know? Uh, uh, it would be me and not, none that I know of, so start an issue. All right. Can do it. Excellent. Um, and then over the weekend, I built a circuit and a 3D printed box for a BLE smart USB charger that shuts off when the phone indicates the battery is full. And next up is Higher Effect. Alrighty, uh, so this past week, uh, I added analog in to the ESP32 S2. Um, and as a part of that, uh, because the analog uh, in system on the ESP32 S2 is not super accurate, uh, we found out there was basically, it, it's it's not very accurate, it's not uh, rail to rail. Um, uh, and the accuracy we can fix by uh, including uh, calibration code from the ESP IDF, but our ESP IDF was actually a forked version. It was a a copy of the kind of the main version because we were having compiling issues. So uh, I ended up spending a, a good amount of time on bringing or on trying to go back to um, the master branch of the ESP32 IDF uh, from Espressif. Um, and uh, that kind of had all sorts of issues and, and we're still a little bit stuck because unfortunately um, tiny USB doesn't work on the latest version of it. Um, but uh, it doesn't compile cleanly with our CI system on the version that USB does work on. So <laughs> we're kind of in this little catch-22 zone uh, where, where nothing works. Um, so uh, I'm going to be waiting on that to finish before we can merge anything, but I can also uh, still work on implementing analog uh, out, which is uh, a good bit more straightforward. Um, and probably think about beyond that, uh, looking at touch IO and uh, rotary IO and some of the other things that we want on the ASP32 S2. Um, this week, uh, I'm going to be uh, doing some stuff that's outside of the actual core. So updating the STM32 F405 guide, um, which has had uh, just some, some little minor tweaks that it needs in the time that that board has been live. Um, apparently, checking out uh, Foamy Guys new input output error. Uh, uh oh. Um, uh, hopefully, that most of the time that error shows up with um, just not having your names of your pins correct. So hopefully, that's like maybe an issue with a guide or or something else that's that's easily fixed. Um, I'm gonna finish up analog out. So the DAC digital to analog converter on the ESP32 S2. I'm gonna test uh, the CAN bus from Jeff because. Uh, can parts have one day shipping from Amazon? And I don't understand how that's a thing because it's like, how many people order can buses? But I'm going to get them tomorrow. So uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, and then also reviewing uh, Mark Olson's F USB fix so that we can finally get the STM32 F1 supported insert Python, which uh, will be cool. So that's it for me. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is Jeff Epler. Hello again. So uh, last week, I spent the bulk of my time on this implementation of CanIO for STM32. That had been going on for a while, but I finally found uh, kind of the, the lingering problems that were preventing it from working at all, and then the one last problem, and put in the pull request. And I fixed some miscellaneous bugs, like this RGB matrix thing that we've talked about elsewhere in the meeting did code reviews and just generally trying, but uh, not always sure I'm succeeding at keeping on top of stuff. Uh, so besides finishing up the STM32 CanIO PR to where it can be merged, uh, my other activity is gonna be more directed at Arduino than CircuitPython. Specifically, uh, the goal is to bring the implementation of CanIO for the SAM E51 uh, into the Arduino environment so that we can either um, ideally share the code between the two projects. Uh, but if that doesn't work out, just take advantage of my current knowledge of how that works to get it working on Arduino one way or another. So uh, maybe a little less activity from me on the CircuitPython side. And if you wonder why, that's it. All right, thanks, Jeff. Next up is Jerry. 
Oh, let's see. I gotta find my notes right there. They are. Um, so nothing, nothing special. Circuit Python related this week to report. Um, had a nice time last week hiking in Acadia National Park. It was a beautiful place, but boy, a lot of people there. At least peeping <laughs> seasons in full bloom. And I voted, so now I can ignore my phone and my email for the rest of the month. That's excellent that. on all counts. <laughs> All right, and that is status updates. Thank you everyone who participated and thank you everyone who lurks through all of what we're up to. Um, that brings us to In the Weeds. So In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions, things that don't make sense in, um... hey Jerry, can you mute? Um things that don't make sense in status updates uh, and or questions, things that you actually want to discuss. Um, that's what we have in the weeds for. So uh, we have three topics so far and um, what I will do is hand it over and then we will discuss each one. So first up, um, I will hand it over to Dishifu. Okay, so as I mentioned already, I I tried this uh, beta one uh, release of CircuitPython with the PewPew Pew 10 devices. And uh, the, the thing that PewPew Pew 10 have uh, special is a module written in C that uses uh, one of the timers to drive the uh, LED display on those devices. It's basically scanning rows and columns and uh, displaying uh, whatever it is to be displayed there. And uh, I noticed that uh, compared to version 5, uh, in version 6, uh, the display looks very flickery. Like uh, the pixels that, uh, because there are four levels of brightness for the pixels. The on pixels and the off pixels are fine, but the two intermediate levels, uh, which are done by, by a kind of PWM, uh, think uh, they are very flickery. So I, I connected a, a logic analyzer to one of the pins to, to see what's happening. And it seems that uh, the timer that is driving the interrupt that is controlling the matrix is uh, very inconsistent in, uh, in uh, how to say it, in how often the interrupt is getting triggered. And uh, because of those inconsistencies, there are uh, differences in the PWM that is getting generated. And that's why it's, it looks like it's flickering because the average time by which uh, each of the LEDs is on, uh, it's uh, like uh, changing very rapidly. So that's what I've got so far. And uh, I don't really have any ideas about how to even start debugging it further. So I would love to hear any suggestions of what I can do. Are you like... calling sleep? No. I, I, I especially uh, modified one of the programs uh, to make sure that no sleep is uh, uh, being called. I, I replaced uh, any sleep with, uh, with a, a busy loop. Uh, calling time dot monotonic, and uh, the effect is the same. So, this is not uh, not sleep itself. Right. The other thing you can do it so like sleep will now call wait for interrupt. So, if you dig into like supervisor port dot c, if you just d disable the WFI, you could see if that's actually it. Because like maybe it has to do with like clocks trying to go to sleep. Um, okay. But I think that's unlikely. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, also I, I thought it might be related to the changes, uh, to the fixes in pulls in that were necessary after adding the sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, there were some changes in priority of USB interrupts and things like that. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the flickering persists even with USB disconnected. Mm -hmm. So that's also another data point that oh, may, maybe will be mm -hmm. useful. So two things I want to try next. I didn't have uh, time over the weekend for this. 
is to also look at the PWM signal because it's being driven by the same clock. And that would tell us if it's the clock or if it's the uh, interrupt itself. Right. And uh, then I want to try and interrupt that only toggles a pin and doesn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. Because that's, uh, at least then I, I would know if the, if the interrupt is maybe taking too long or something like that. Right. Uh, but otherwise I have no, no really no ideas of what, what could be happening. So what you can see on the, on the uh, logic analyzer is that uh, generally the, the time between the interrupt being triggered is slightly longer than it's supposed to be by a random amount. So this does look like a priority thing or something like right, that. Right. Yep. That sounds like interrupt contention or something. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, that only happens on SAMD21, not on SAMD51. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the gamepad, pro uh, yeah, this is also probably re uh, related thing is that gamepad is also uh, uh, losing key presses and uh, it may be related to that, but I haven't looked into gamepad uh, deeply very, very, very much yet. I, I, I might, because mm -hmm. gamepad doesn't actually generate any signal, so it's hard to look at the logic analyzer with it right but, yeah right so the issue with gamepad is that um on the 21 that we we switched to using the rtc in kind of like a less than ideal way to do the tick based stuff um so like all but the SAMD21, all rtcs are able to do periodic interrupts but the SAMD21 can't which means we like if you're in if it, if you're in tick mode, it has to like perpetually set like a millisecond later to interrupt again, and I think there's some uncertainty in like how that math ends up. Um, that okay, could be so doing but some uh, inconsistency. That should be easy to fix because right uh, when I wrote gamepad, I only uh, made it uh, trigger like every forty or something like that uh, x. So right. we can just increase increase the the frequency for some D twenty one and that should uh, resolve this. Because yeah, does... I'm not sure whether I, we already deleted that or not, but yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, so so that 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 might be easier to fix. Yep. Yeah, I, the twenty the twenty one's just a little sucky like that we could think about using a, a separate tc to do it but like the goal is to use the low frequency rtc to do it yeah because uh, yeah. everything else can turn uh, off i i i can also rewrite gamepad to use a, a timer and that's not a problem gamepad gamepad might actually be able to use external interrupt right use the exti uh... peripheral it's gamepad shift that's going to have the problem right that's that's true. Um, yeah, so, so, that's, so a, that's an alternative. In the war, in the worst case, we can just rewrite the whole library to to do something completely different. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there there have been reports of the code.py re the the code reload like on saving being wonky too. So I do want to take a look at that later this week. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so it, I, it all kind of sounds would... like the same problem. Yeah, so I guess uh, the next steps for me is to try with PWM and with just toggling the pin. Yep. And yeah, then I, I'm out of ideas. Well, I think that's a good that's a good idea. Okay. It's a good place to start. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up, um, I have an in the weeds topic from MicroDev. Let me get a time code here. Um, so I will turn it over to MicroDev to talk about that. Yeah, I would like to start by giving Jeff a mention as he is the one who originally posted this. Let me post the link. So 
uh, here is a delay in main.c file which can be avoided it is too specific and the reason for it doesn't really explain its necessity i mean we can have a battery failure after 1.5 second delay so i think the delay duration is totally random and it's also too specific uh, for other programs uh, which are not running on battery power i think in general it's there to just make sure the power is stable by the time that we're starting up yeah but uh, i find the delay duration to be like totally random like we can have it doesn't properly uh, like uh, eliminate the chance of having a battery failure during the right operation of boot dot boot output file right do you do you want to explain the context why you're bringing this up because i have a so, feeling i know what it is <laughs> yeah it's last week jeff mentioned about it and uh, i i have also added a delay in main.c after code.py finishes for usb checking so the whole code.py loading process is uh, like it takes 5 uh, seconds at least to finish the execution now so i was thinking of like removing uh, why did you so why did you add a delay so the thing is the usb uh, mount process takes time right so if we don't have uh, like if we only have a print statement in the code.py file mm -hmm. uh, we end up with a false uh, like a negative uh, uh, from the usb check that we do for deep sleep and then we enter the deep sleep uh, and then it just cycles back so that's why ah. and also safe mode can't prevent it because it runs after code.py right but that's so, that's fine that's fine because it it runs after code.py right so it's okay yeah, to have the delay then, afterwards but then we are in a loop like we have entered deep sleep cause the uh, code thinks that usb isn't connected but uh, the thing is that it it isn't mounted yet so That's right. Fine. So you need to you need to keep track of like how long have I been booted up and did it give USB time to enumerate? Yeah. Before deep sleeping for the first time. Yeah. Um which I imagine you can do by just looking at ticks, right? Like you can so get So what current... I have got currently implemented is a is a variable delay kind of so it uh, keeps on checking for uh, one second. Uh, if we don't have usb connected then it uh, it keeps on checking for like a second at mm -hmm. a 10 millisecond uh, interval okay. so the moment we go we get uh, uh, that usb is connected it just exits out of the loop and if we don't have uh, connect uh, usb connected then after one second it enters deep sleep so right. uh, i think that works that is a, a, a good application right that i can think of. right I guess I don't I I don't really want to get rid of this delay that you pointed to though because we were having reliability issues with power and this was added because it made power like it it reduced those issues. My get my guess was that you wanted to get rid of this value because you wanted to start up after deep sleep faster. That is also a thing. like right. if the the code run time that we can save uh, will make us run longer right. if we are doing deep sleep right and that in in that case i think what we should do is we should know what why we're starting up right like in in this early code including the bootloader we should say if we're starting up from deep sleep we don't want to do any of the delays that we do because we also do a 700 millisecond delay for safe mode yeah, checking safe. like we should yes. just have a flag that we check early that says are we actually just waking from deep sleep and if so just skip the all of that process so one thing i have been thinking about as a solution like if we don't uh, want this relay to be removed is uh, uh, do we have a, a something like a, a, a config file that can be in the drive with circuit by drive 
and uh, it may be a, for a txt or a json file which can uh, which can be used to edit the parameters which are not not in control of the modules embedded in shared shared bindings and common hall i mean that's what boot.py is for okay so i don't i don't think we want a second config okay 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 how would how would the the a conditional delay i mean we could add a new a new kind of delay that actually has a conditional part of it where it, where it's like specific common how function for conditional delay startup delay let me just pause the delay i'm using currently like i mean i think i think at the core we want to not delay if we're starting up from deep sleep and Jeff's also pointing it the out that like we have some trickery to skip this part if we think that we're that our boot output's gonna be the same. So this is the uh, uh, delay I'm currently using for checking USB if USB is connected after code.py finishes. Mm -hmm. So it just exits as soon as uh, there is uh, a confirmation of USB connection. Okay. So. So I think there are only two delays, like one is for this 1.5 second delay and the other one is for safe mode. I don't think we should concern much about the safe mode one because it's 700 milliseconds and can be edited from boot.py file if we want to implement such thing. No, it can't because say, that safe mode delay happens before boot.py is run. Like I, I think we really just want a flag that says we're starting up from not power on reset, so we should, or or manual reset button, like, All... like the okay. the UF two bootloader also has a delay that we want to treat that way too. Yeah, yeah, like UF that, two also. Right, that's how the double tap to get in the bootloader works. Is that there's a delay in the in the bootloader too. So yeah, so the only reason I was concerned about this one is uh, uh, the reason here uh, uh, here is kind of sketchy. So like uh, it only yeah. addresses uh, yeah. So if, if we, uh, I think we should also include like the crashing thing that you mentioned that uh, there were crashes if this delay wasn't added. So I thought it was only a battery specific thing. So, like, we don't have, uh, we, uh, there is a very small percentage of pe people which run battery specific things. So, that's why I was concerned about this. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can add more detail to this, but, I, like, we, we added it there because we were having issues with it. So, and Dan, okay. Dan, I think, is the person who did it. And so, we could ask him hopefully next week. Uh, yeah. For some more background as well. Yeah. So maybe uh, just file an issue on that, and and Dan will see it. He's just busy okay. still because he's not home yet. Okay. So yeah. So let's continue this discussion over on GitHub. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we have one more topic, and I will turn it over to Scott. All right, so um, Hacktoberfest is something we've done the last few years, and people really like it. Uh, we've had generally pretty good response. We haven't had too much spam. Mm -hmm. We did see a little bit last year. Um, but uh, Tshipu, do you want to give the background about that YouTuber again? OK, yeah. So this year uh, was a bit different because uh, there was uh, one very popular YouTube channel that basically basically gave an step by step uh, instruction on how to make a, a pull request uh, into whatever project you like. And the problem is, I, I'm sure this is not intentional to to create a problem, but the problem is uh, that the example was pretty 
like uh, very simplified. So he basically edited a readme file and added an awesome project to the header of the readme file. And uh, of course, that was supposed to be an example, but uh, he has so many followers that many of them uh, just followed those instructions like, blindly and just did exactly the same thing. So suddenly on, on the very, on the 1st of October, uh, in the morning, like as soon as, as uh, 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 people woke up, they, they found a lot of, uh, in, in popular projects at least, they found a lot of those pointless uh, pull requests. And uh, there was a, a bit of a uh, backlash, basically, against uh, digital ocean and and the whole idea of 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 this thing and uh, yeah and now we have an opt-in for it basically mm -hmm. that's 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 the short of it as as far as i can see it i got only one request uh, exactly with the awesome project thing <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not too badly <laughs> hit right. by this but but people in in projects like django for instance were, were completely swamped yeah yeah, I saw a lot of I, I saw a lot of uproar on on GitHub about this or on Twitter as well about this. Um, I think there is uh, for those of folks who haven't seen it, there is this really good book that came out this year called Working in Public, um, which I linked to in my video last time. But it actually pushes back on the idea of like um, bringing new people in is good in the sense of like bringing people in once for something small is actually like potentially more of a tax on the developers than the benefit of the thing that they do. And so I think that was kind of the crux of this, uh, this problem where it's like people are making really small commits with no commitment to the project in the longer term. Um, and, uh, and that's yeah, and actually also, not also, better for well, you know, bringing people to your pro like having people come to your project when you are not prepared to properly introduce them into this project and you right. help them with everything right. is also probably a bad idea. So this opt in thing. Yeah. So I think so. To get to the point, I think we have two options. Um, there's two levels of opt in now. There is, um, we can opt in individual PRs that people make, and I think we should do that. Uh, basically, like any PR that we see on libraries or CircuitPython that we think are valuable, let's just add, I think it's Hacktoberfest-accepted. Um, I think that's easy, and we should do it. Um, and kind of like gets us all Hacktoberfest gear, which I <laughs> I like the shirts. Yeah, um, it's a nice shirt. I want that shirt. Yeah, uh, and it looked like they were probably limiting the number of shirts and then planting trees for the remainder or, or giving people the option of not getting the shirt. But uh, I have a feeling they're going to get a lot, of, lot less people this year because of this. Um, so I think we should do that. I think we should be willing to do Hacktoberfest-accepted on PRs and stuff. Um, the bigger question, I think, is you can also opt in repositories using a uh, Hacktoberfest topic for the repository. And that is the question I want us to uh, debate because I have a feeling that, it, you know, as one of the fewer projects that are actually part of it, we might get a lot of attention, um, which we could probably disable if it turns out badly, but um, just wanted to get folks' opinion on that. So repo specific? Yeah. Because yeah, so I, I, we would... Oh, sorry we would be going across you know 260 libraries we don't have to no i'm just saying that that would be like i'm I'm not sure that's tenable um just specific to the way that our circuit python library you know infrastructure is um, right i have a feeling there's an api for adding the topic if we wanted to do it with a script okay I mean, um, that's not but we question. could also yeah we could also choose to just do it on like the core and see how it goes yeah, so I was I was doing some research earlier. It seems like that's like the big complaint is is one, if you have a lot of repos, adding the topic to all the repos is the um, 
it, that's a big maintenance task. Uh, and then it also opens you up to spam in sort of a, a targeted way. Right. Um, I suppose the change, but I, I did have a question, which is, um, I, I thought that actually marking the repo, regardless of how you mark the PR is a requirement. It is not. They, it looks like they changed that. So if we don't have the topic on the repo, but we still mark PRs as Hacktoberfest accepted, those will still count. Okay, that's that's good. From what I understand. Um, which I think kind of gets it, like allows our community to participate without kind of opening ourselves up, <laughs> kind of like server discovery for Discord. Like if yeah. you know that we're doing it, you can do it and we can support you with it. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, that seems like the best way to do it. Cause I mean, anybody who's who's interested, like really interested in, in CircuitPython is probably you know, at least a circuit Python Easter is on the Discord or something like that. You know, um, right. or or we could yeah, encourage we're... them to get on the Discord to check out Hacktoberfest as opposed to just saying, "Hey, you know," just broadcasting it in sort of this anonymous way with the Hacktoberfest label. You know, we could market it differently, right? So you have to add a label that's Hacktoberfest dash accepted. Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. So we'll have to add the label and then mark the PRs with those. Right. Yeah, it's on this post. Yeah, so I think the advertise not not marking the repository and advertising instead that 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 we do Hacktoberfest only in the Circuit Python. The best of of what we could do. I think so too. So in already... terms of retaining the people that come, we we already have like you know our good first issues labeled Hacktoberfest, which means people will find them. Um, by searching, you know, and then, you know, people can do them and we can deal with, um, I mean, that that's going to be the most likely to attract spam, but it shouldn't attract too much because it's not a ton of issues. Yeah, I wonder, like, the, I haven't actually looked at the, like, let me find a Hacktoberfest thing. Right. Um, I mean, the website is only pointing to the marked repos, from what I can tell. Um, but, you know, again, I, I think, you know, we could we could also, I mean, this is obviously just on, on the Adafruit end, but, uh, you know, you, the word could be put out in, in, in other ways than the official label, right? So it's like, and, and then it's more targeted at people who are kind of already in the community. But it's like, if you want to learn, if you want to be a part of Hacktoberfest, you know, you can make a, a PR to, to CircuitPython, you can make a PR to the libraries, um, and, you know, we'll... It, just, just putting the word out through other means than this sort of anonymous label delivery. Right. But what we'll have to do is um, ensure that we go mark all of these PRs uh, as Hacktoberfest accepted, right? That's what the work that is new on our end that we did not have before. Correct. Correct. We have to do something on each PR. We have to do that either way as well. So like marking the repository with the topic does not exclude us needing to mark the PR as a like label the PR. I I I don't think that's true. I think it's it's the, if the if the if the repository is marked with Hacktoberfest topic, then uh, if a PR is merged or approved, it automatically goes in. As opposed to at least that's how I'm interpreting what what Jeff posted in in the chat here, where it's it's kind of got the uh, and it's got this kind of and or you know syntax here. But I it, I'm seeing that the PR is labeled as Hacktoberfest accepted or submitted in a repo with Hacktoberfest topic and merged or approved. So if you're okay. grouping by the ors, I think I think it's it's that. If you're if you mark it with the Hacktoberfest, if you mark your whole PR with Hacktoberfest topic, then 
you don't have to go through and repo, individually label PRs or a repo. Yeah, when you when you made it, label a whole repo, you don't have to go in and add individual issues. Um, you can just merge or approve them. Uh, okay, I see what you're saying. So, so if they're not approved or merged, the the label also accepts it. Yes, right. Yeah. So so if you if you had your PR closed, I guess that's for like an edge case where your PR gets closed, but it's enough effort that it gets accepted by the like the maintainer wants to give you credit, I guess. Um or just needs more time or something. I don't know. Uh anyway, I, I guess the kind of the amount of work from the maintainer end is basically do you have so many repos that adding the topic to them all is a huge pain? Or I'm do you have sure so there's... many PRs? Right. It's like it's like the, the comparable number of, of PRs that come in that need labels versus the, the number of just raw potential repositories that need a label. Um, my intuition right. is that it would be the second it would be easier that the, the PRs being labeled is probably a more doable task, but I, I don't know. That's, well, we that's have, I, I think Scott's right. That's probably an API to add a topic. So that would be a small amount of work to write a script, add it to Adabot, and then boom, done. Um, but is that the route we want to go? Right. I mean, we're, only, is... we're getting tens of PRs per week on the libraries, right? So we could just do it by. Yeah, we just make sure that everybody who's merging PRs and or we need to make sure that somebody is staying on top of merged PRs. You understand right. what I'm saying? Because like there's a lot of people who are merging PRs. Is there any way that we could write a script that actually automatically adds the label anytime a PR is merged? Mm. If, if we merge it, right, it's it's we're probably accepting it for Hacktoberfest. I think sort it's of like a pseudo edition. I, I think because it's just a monthly thing, we probably yeah. just want to find like some magical search incantation on GitHub that just tells us like, is the PR merged and doesn't have this label or something like in that. In this time period, yeah, I'm that's am just... pretty good at making Makes go sense. get search it or GitHub searches. So I'll, I'll try to yeah. come up with one. And I think we should just backstop it with like, if any of us is trying to get four and we need somebody to add the label, like <laughs> just ping each other. Yeah. Like, and we can, oh, and like you were sure saying, like we can advertise it. Okay. Yeah. I say let's do it per PR and see how it goes. Okay. I, I'm tempted to try to add the topic on the core just to see. Yeah. I mean, you, you how, absolutely how can. Bad it gets. Try it, try it and see what happens. And I will, so, we'll, we'll go. Per our core is going to be the sacrificial lamb. I wonder well, what I, happens if we add it and then we, we remove it. Like, do they have like a counter? Like no more Hacktoberfest <laughs> label or like I don't know. I mean, worst case, we just have to label the stuff that that like was done in the interim or something. Right. I guess I'm more comfortable doing the core repo just because I do a lot of the PR stuff there. I don't want to like doing it on other repos puts the burden on other people more than me. Okay. Sounds good. We All have right. a plan. Yep. And with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up. Um, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for October 5th, 2020. Um, we, uh, let's see, next week the meeting is on Tuesday. Um, so be aware of that. It'll still be at uh, 11, um, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, please consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. This video will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, it'll also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Um, like I said, the next meeting is on Tuesday. The meeting will be held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. And to be notified about the meeting um, and any changes to the day or time, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role, and we will send a notification about the change in the meeting. And that is 
what we've got. So we hope to see you all next week. Uh, remember, we will see you on Tuesday. So thanks, everyone. Have a good week, everybody. So I'll have a good next, uh, see you next week.